The epistle reading comes from Romans 1, 1 through 7, and you can find it on page 913 in your pew Bibles. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name, including yourselves who are called to, to belong to Jesus Christ, to all God's beloved in Rome who are called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, our second reading today is from the Gospel according to St. Luke. It's from the first chapter, verses 26 through 38. And this is another lectionary reading from this Advent season. Last week, we read a passage where an angel appeared to Joseph, uh, Jesus' earthly father, uh, to let him know about the birth of our Lord. And this passage today is where the angel is appearing to Mary. Uh, the mother of our Lord begins in verse 26 saying in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David the virgin's name was Mary and he came to her and said greetings favored one the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I'm a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth is in her old age. She, she has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. May God add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment before we reflect today. Oh God, we thank you for this sacred journey of Advent. We thank you for this opportunity to focus on you and the incredible gift that you gave us when you came into this world in Christ. Your love for us that surpasses our understanding, greater than we can comprehend, that compelled you to come into this dark world and bring the light of new hope here and for all eternity. Bless us as we reflect today upon your word and fill us with wisdom and the joy of serving you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, names, people's names, are significant. Now, this is why most families are thoughtful about the names they give children. Uh, 
You know, they don't name their children as they would uh, perhaps their hamster or their cat, calling them, you know, doo-doo or fluffy or ding-ding or something. They choose names that are more meaningful to them in some way. Uh, For instance, uh, my name is Jonathan, as is our organist and music director, Jonathan Block. His first name also is Jonathan. And that is a Hebrew word that actually translates as a short English phrase. Consists of the word Yah, in the beginning, an abbreviated form of the name Yahweh, and the word Natan, which is the third person singular form of the Hebrew verb to give. So Jonathan, Yonatan, literally means Yahweh gave, God gave. And uh, while I like to think that my parents called me that because they pondered what a gift this new child would be to their lives, there's also another possibility considering my mother was in labor with me for 26 hours in a Central American hospital with no pain medication, perhaps their thought process was more like, thank you God for the gift that this kid has finally been born. That's probably where it came from. But the reasons might differ, uh, but people's names, they are significant. And this is also true about the names that Jesus is given in Scripture. Uh, They're significant in their own way. Names like Son of God, Emmanuel, Lord and Savior, and even the name Jesus itself. These are not only titles, but the meanings of these words themselves teach us about Jesus himself. And each of them actually gives us important insights into why God came into this world in Christ and what it means to follow Jesus. Now the meanings of some of Jesus' names do this by teaching us about who Jesus is. But others, just as vitally, do it by teaching us who Jesus is not. In our scripture readings today, they contain examples of both of these things. Our gospel reading, as I mentioned, is this story about an encounter that Mary, the mother of Jesus, had with an angel before she became pregnant with our Lord. And in the passage, the angel tells Mary in verse 21, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. So there's one of Jesus' names right there. And now since Mary was a virgin, she understandably asks in verse 34, how will this be? Which by the way, is definitely right up there in, you know, the top ten best questions of all time. And I'm, uh, but the angel then goes on to explain in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. So there's another name for Jesus right there. And Mary, of course, was Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Now, we discussed last week that becoming pregnant outside of wedlock in Mary's society would have brought with it serious ramifications for Mary and her fiancé, Joseph. It would have upended their lives at the very least, and it maybe could have even gotten both of them killed. So having an angel appear to Mary and tell her what was going on, you know, that it was God who was giving her this baby, undoubtedly set her mind at ease. But the two names that the angel gives Jesus themselves, the names that he calls her son in the passage, might also 
have calmed Mary's spirit. In verse 31, the angel calls him Jesus. We hear that term a lot, Jesus, in in the Greek. Um, And it says a lot, though, about who Jesus is. It's derived from an old Hebrew term called Yehoshua, which literally means God saves his people. So the name of Mary's son itself would have told her that the purpose of her son's birth was to save humanity, which is no small thing and certainly would have been encouraging. So God wrote the primary purpose of Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection right into Jesus' name itself. It would be like, uh, for instance, one of us going over to a new friend's house and meeting their new dog for the first time, whose name, you know, was Child Eater, okay? Now, well, the name of that dog itself might prompt us to ask ourselves whether it would be wise for us to bring our children with us the next time we visit it. The name itself has meaning, and the name Jesus itself, likewise, would have said a lot to Mary about who her son would be. But the angel also gives him another name, which is just as important. In verse 35, Son of God, he calls him. Um, And that would have encouraged Mary for another reason. Because this phrase, Son of God, you know, to us it, it sounds, you know, just like, well, God giving birth to his son, and, you know, it could mean all sorts of things, but it had a very specific meaning in Mary's society. Um, uh, it would have let her know what Jesus would not become. Because in Jesus' day, the name Son of God referred to the Roman Emperor. Using it in any other way was treasonous. So this is a treasonous document that we study every week here, the Bible. The Son of God was the Roman Emperor. And Paul, in our epistle reading today, he also uses this phrase, along with some other names, when talking about Jesus. He talks about the gospel of God's Son, who is declared to be Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now what's interesting is that on the ancient Via Ignatia, which is the major east-to-west road that ran through the Roman Empire. Archaeologists, they uncovered an inscription that was honoring Caesar Augustus, the first Roman emperor. And this is what the inscription said. It said, Caesar, God, Son of God, Savior. Sounds very familiar. And at another location on the ancient Roman building in the same area, this, there were, uh, it's archaeologists they discovered recently, a Caesar Augustus has fulfilled all the hopes of earlier times. The birthday of this God has been for the whole world the beginning of the gospel concerning him. And that sounds an awful lot like the angels and St. Paul's description of Jesus. Only guess what? These inscriptions were both written decades before Paul wrote his letters. For many years the Romans called their emperors God, Son of God, Lord of the people, and Savior because they instituted the Pax Romana, a peace throughout the empire created through force and oppression, a peace they maintained through a combination of brutality and underhanded economic tactics that they used to ultimately suck the wealth and the will to fight out of the societies, out of the people that they conquered. So the angel, when talking to Mary, And St. Paul, in our passage and elsewhere, uses these same names used of the Roman emperors who oversaw all this injustice to describe Jesus, the one who God had sent to save his people. 
He calls him Son of God, Lord and Savior of the world, in order to contrast the two. In order to remind Mary and all of us who Jesus is not. That Jesus is a great king, the greatest indeed. He is Son of God. But he's a king who offers peace in a much different way than the Roman emperors did. Jesus establishes peace through faith, spread to others by care and compassion, people sharing and loving and sacrificing for one another. A peace that isn't achieved by oppressing people, but a peace that's achieved by setting people free to live as God created them to live. A peace unlike the Pax Romana, that can last forever, that can extend all the way into eternity for those who believe. So in our gospel reading, when the angel uses the name Son of God to refer to Mary's son, through that name and the name Jesus itself, that the angel just used before that, what he's saying to Mary, without saying anything else, just by those two names, he's saying, your son will be a new kind of emperor, a new kind of leader through whom God will offer the gift of eternal salvation to all people. The angel's use of these names themselves, it reinforces what the angel says in verse 33. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But wait, see there's more. I sound like one of those QVC infomercials. There's more. There's more. In our passage last week from St. Matthew's Gospel, there was another name given to Jesus uh, when the angel appeared to Joseph. It was the Hebrew term Emmanuel that's used of Jesus. Now that literally means Elohim is with us. And Elohim is one of several names used for God in the Old Testament, all of which emphasize different things. And Elohim emphasizes God's greatness or his fullness. So what's interesting is when you take all these names of Jesus and you string their meanings together into a single phrase, Jesus, Son of God, Lord, and Emmanuel, what do you get? This is apart from all the detailed information we read in the Gospels and New Testament letters about the meaning of Jesus' life in ministry. Uh, this is what we get from simply stringing the meanings of the knee Jesus' names together um, as people would have heard them in Jesus' day. It says, God will save his people by being with them in his fullness as a new kind of emperor who will bring peace in the people's lives, not temporarily through force and oppression, but eternally through faith and the compassion and justice that spreads into and through the lives of all who believe in and follow him. So Jesus, Son of God, Lord Emmanuel, there's a lot we can learn from Jesus just in those names itself. Contained within them are the meanings of everything that we celebrate about Jesus at Christmas time and throughout the year when we worship him. We embrace into our hearts a Savior who fills us with the power to both transform and transcend this world for eternity. So it's my prayer that as we use these names here today and on Christmas Eve, that we would be filled with hope and knowledge of who our Lord is. May the names of Jesus be forever praised. Amen.